Hi, I'm Phil Lepshevitz. I'm the station manager here at Minute Man Media Network, and welcome to Concord Days. I'm sitting in for Tammy Rose this week, but of course, Richard Smith, the co-host, is here. Richard, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me here again today, Phil. Nice to see you. My name is Richard Smith. I am a historian and writer in Concord, Massachusetts, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a very special guest here today on Concord Days. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. I know that Phil has known him for a long time as well, and I would like to welcome Jim Hollister from Minuteman National Historic Park. Hi, Jim. Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you, Richard. Good doing well thanks for being here we appreciate that so your official title is park ranger park ranger <laughs> there are lots of park rangers i guess what do you do as a park ranger for minuteman national historic park sure um well there there's what i do in normal times and there's what i've been doing in uh these uh covid days um so as, as you said my official title is park ranger um but under that um you know, usually I cover, uh, you know, the education programs, the living history program, um, and then also digital media. And, um, and also I run the historic weapons program, and which bleeds into the living history aspect of it, um, naturally. Um, however, this past year, really, I've been focusing a lot more on digital media and uh, creating uh, digital content. So learning how to shoot and edit video, um, learning a lot from Phil, and, um, okay. and and working with our partners and uh, and and just trying to continue the engagement uh, with our visitors uh, at a time when, you know, normally we'd be doing programs, public programs, and education programs, and meeting people and giving tours. We can't do that, um, but there's still an opportunity to reach people and using. Um, you know, web and social media, and you can reach a huge audience of people that may never visit the park or may never have thought to visit the park. And so we can, we can reach them and, um, and start kind of getting our, our story out there. And, um, you know, and then hopefully someday they'll, you know, when they're able to, they can come to the park and we can interact with them personally like we normally do. Um, so really just trying to look at the opportunities um, because we aren't doing the other things, so there's more time uh, to work on on digital media, digital interpretation. Well, we we've all become experts on digital interpretation <laughs> since the pandemic hit. Um, a lot of us who deal with the public by giving tours or lectures uh, or doing interpretive programs like you do at the park, suddenly we had no audience uh, as of a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, was it a uh, was it a bit of a scramble? for all of you at, at Minuteman to suddenly realize that you weren't allowed to, to deal with the public? I mean, what happened when the word came down that, that things were gonna change radically for interpretive programs? So what happened actually, uh, when, when COVID hit, I was in Alabama um, at the uh, National Park Service Historic Weapons course. I'm one of the instructors. And, you know, we're all just watching the news and watching the dominoes fall one by one. And, you know, all the while I'm getting emails um, and Facebook messages from our volunteers, uh, the reenactor saying, what's happening? Are we going to be able to do Patriots Day? And um, so I was working with um, Superintendent Dunn and, um, and the management team. And, and, it, and it basically, uh, we, we were finally confronted with the reality that we were not going to be able to hold um, live Patriots Day events. And um, so that's, that's kind of how it started. So um, I started talking with, with um, some of our volunteers about, you know, well, what can we do um, in lieu of uh, live events? And so, and I was, again, I was working with Phil uh, in Minuteman Media uh, Network and, um, and some of the, the uh, local personalities and, and kind of came up with uh, a modest but um, very well received um, suite of, of virtual programs. And, uh, and, and I was surprised at how many people we were able to reach uh, through this. Um, so it did start with a scramble um, and just trying to figure out like, now what are we going to do? And, uh, and for the people that are joining us that are watching this who aren't from Concord or even from Massachusetts, they should know that in Concord and Lexington, Patriots Day every April is taken very seriously. <laughs> it's, it's holiday not, too. 
it's the high holy, uh, high holy day in Massachusetts. And of course, it's the day that the Boston Marathon happens, which has been canceled for the last couple of years. But in Lexington and Concord, there are programs and parades and reenactments and lectures and all kinds of things going on. I think in the 20 some years that I've been in Concord, it's only the, the events, the events have only been canceled two or three times because of weather. So for Patriots Day to be canceled, so to speak, is a huge deal. Oh, it was. I mean, it, it just, it just um, we were all in shock. Um, you know, when you say canceling because of weather, that's usually only partially canceled. There's all sorts of things that Sudbury will say, we're still coming or Acton will still, you know, do their march, you know, through a driving rainstorm. Uh, I mean, that's how dedicated people are. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it, it, it was shocking to all of us that we had to actually like, nope, full stop, cancel. Um, so talk a little bit about your involvement um, with, the, with the living history and the black powder. Uh, over the years, I think Minuteman, well, a lot of the national parks, but Minuteman in particular, at least in my mind, is really well known for the, the first rate living history programs that you do at the park. Um, talk a little bit about that. I know that you've done living history. I think, didn't you do living history even before you were a ranger? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I was doing so, Civil War. Okay, so that's right. When we met, you were you were doing Civil War. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about your involvement with that and the sort of living history programs in normal times uh, that would be going on at the park. Sure. Um, so yeah, I came into this as a reenactor. I was heavily involved in Civil War reenacting. And I actually, true story, said to my brother once before I got involved at the park, I said, you know, I wish I lived in Virginia. There's so much history there. And my brother, who's not interested in history, said, well, you know, Jim, you live in Massachusetts. Um, maybe there's something here that would catch your interest. And of course, I opened my eyes and I saw Minuteman and I just fell in love. Um, but um, so I started getting more involved with as a volunteer, um, taking part in living history events. Um, and then when I came into my position, um, first as a seasonal, then as a permanent uh, career employee, and I began sort of like, okay, now I'm going to have some major influence on the living history um, program here. Um, I've always been a, a, a strong proponent for if you're going to do living history, if you're going to put on uh, the clothing of the past, it's not just clothing. You are, you're putting on an identity. You know, you're telling your audience, you know, look at me and think of them. You know, uh, it's a huge responsibility. And so it's something that you really have to approach with a great deal of care and effort and research. And there's a lot of people um, with a very similar attitude in this area. Um, so I noticed, of course, immediately that there's uh, a very active um, living history community uh, around Minuteman, um, you know, in eastern Massachusetts and also in Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire. I mean, it's you know, it's a really active area for um, 18th century living history in particular. And, uh, and a lot of people who are kind of driving things forward, um, you know, very progressively, you know, in research and material culture and how to um, portray these men and women of the past in a way that they wouldn't find offensive, in a way that they would, that, that, that would do honor to them. Um, but at the same time, there's also a lot of really good community organizations, they're not as much up on their material culture, but they also are very active and very passionate. And we had to make sure that there was a place for them too. Um, right. You know, we, and, um, and so trying to blend all of these different activities. So it's, it's been the work of many, many years. I started really doing this in earnest here at the park um, in 2006 and just kind of been building from there and just found so many um, allies. Uh, in this. And so what we normally offer, you know, of course, our big signature event is Battle Road. Um, so that's a running tactical demonstration along the original Battle Road, um, you know, showing British and colonial tactics. Now, I call it a tactical demonstration, not a battle reenactment, very specifically. Um, and that's because of National Park Service policy. Um, a battle reenactment involves firing at opposing lines and people portraying themselves as killed or wounded. Um, so there's a safety aspect to that, that uh, the powers that be in the Park Service consider not to be an acceptable risk, which is firing um, real muskets, but of course, black, you know, uh, blank charges. Um, but anyway, you know, firing directly at people we don't do. And then portraying casualties 
we don't do. And, and the reason for that, it's not so much the safety aspect of it. It's because unlike at a, you know, say another venue, um, you know, say it like Old Sturbridge Village or something, here we actually have soldiers who died in the battle who are still interred on the battlefield. Right. Um, you know, same thing with Antietam, Gettysburg, you know. Um, so out of respect for those uh, war dead that are still interred on the battlefield, it's cemetery, it's hallowed ground. Um, we'll demonstrate the tactics they use, we'll demonstrate the weapons, we'll show the clothing, the equipment and all of this, um, but we will not make any attempt to recreate their deaths or, or woundings um, through that. So having done, I mean, I did Civil War and, and Revolutionary War way back when. And, you know, the whole, you know, taking a hit and, oh, I'm wounded, oh, I'm dead. I always found that to be, I guess, more than disrespectful in some ways to, to some of the people who actually died, especially if you're doing it near a site where there was a battle or a skirmish or something like that. So I, you know, I, I've always commended the Park Service for taking that attitude, uh, uh, especially if you're down by the Hartwell Tavern. There are people who are probably still buried down there. Yeah, uh, and, and, exactly. And, and that's that's the key difference. I mean, you know, uh, you know, doing an event off site that's not a battlefield. And I think taking hits can be done respectfully, tastefully. Right. Um, <laughs> those who know, know how to do it. Um, and, and, and also proportionally. I mean, that's always one of the big things. Um, but yeah, the Park Service kind of took the attitude that there's really no way to recreate it accurately. You can be respectful about it, but you can't do it accurately. Right. Um, now, have you noticed over the years since you started, for, since you first got involved with reenacting, has there been a change in attitude from from people who do reenacting in living history? Is there, because there are so many uh, sources available to people for clothing and weapons and and personas and things like that? Do you feel like people are more hardcore and more authentic about doing accurate living history than they were maybe ten or even fifteen years ago? Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it always used to be sort of like, you know, there was the hardcore um, element of the hobby, the people who are just, you know, crazy about material culture. And then there was the mainstream, everybody else, decent, you know, impressions, but nothing too crazy. Um, but what I found is that, yeah, with, with access to research being um, easier um, and also I found that, that the, two, the two camps have blended. Um, you know, we've run uh, training at the park. Um, actually, a lot of the volunteers have run this training at the park or through, um, through the park um, to teach people some of the necessary skills, you know, basic sewing, uh, drafting patterns, um, you know, making cartridge pouches or sets of stays and things like that. And what was really wonderful about these trainings, it was called the Hive. Um, and what was really wonderful about these trainings is that it brought all these people together, um, you know, of different levels of experience, skills, and interests, and they all learn from each other. And so once that started happening, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, um, I saw the, the, the quality of historical impressions really jump up. Um, because basically at this point, you know, there, you sort of take the excuse out of it. it's like, you know, well, I can't afford, you know, a hand sewn frock coat or a pair of leather breeches. I, you know, it's like, well, if you've got the time, we'll teach you, you know, and right. there's something really strong to be said about, you know, I will make myself available. I will teach you these skills. And they were just a great time and it really fostered a sense of community. So, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, as they say, a rising tide lifts all boats, the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the bottom end of historical impressions is light years above what it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, yeah. and, it's at, and it's attainable. Um, and also some of the research, like one of my favorite aspects of the Battle Road event um, came about um, about four or five years ago called the civilian evacuation. So, you know, we do, you know, the, the tactical demonstration with the guns, the explosions, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a spectacle, but what you see first are about 40 or 50 men, women, and children, you know, in, in period clothing, they really looked apart, and they're processing down the road. They've got, um, 
you know, they've got wheelbarrows filled with stuff and, and, and packs and baskets um, carrying, you know, infants. I mean, processing down the road. And this is all based on research. I mean, that's really the whole point of it. It's research-based living history. Um, in the work of a local historian, Alex Kane, who did a lot of research on the civilian evacuations and the impact. And I think that really resonated with a lot of our visitors and they realized this isn't, I mean, this isn't just a, a military story. It's that this happened right in the middle of a place where people live. Like, what would you do if a war broke out in your neighborhood? You know, you know that trouble's coming and these people are packing up their belongings, having to make some really difficult choices and not knowing if they're gonna have a home to come back to. Or if they do have a home to come back to, is there gonna be an empty chair? You know, if they had a husband or father or brother off in the fighting. Um, so trying to, to bring that aspect out. So which leads me to the question. So basically Minuteman Park exists because of one day, April 19th, 1775. Yeah. But really your job as a historian and a ranger and an interpreter is not to deal with just one day of American history. You have to deal with the before, during and after April 19th, 1775, don't you? Absolutely. Um, you know, because it's one of those watershed events in history and everything changed. And it had, you know, it, it didn't happen in a vacuum. You know, people were watching this crisis unfold um, year by year until it finally literally ended up in their front yards. Um, and then, of course, there was a long term impact. Um, another event that we do is called After the Battle, where we basically turn Hartwell Tavern into a flop house. You know, we have people coming in, blankets, packs and everything and, and representing like, you know, this, the refugees who are leaving Boston or leaving the environs around Boston, Roxbury, uh, Cambridge, Watertown, Charlestown, getting out and they're coming up into the country uh, with basically no belongings but what they can carry. And towns are being asked to care for them in addition to, um, you know, dealing with their own families and their own situations. Um, so there's a lot of that. And then of course, there's the long, long impact of the revolution, which gets into the 19th century. Um, and we have the wayside home of authors and this idea um, of how, you know, um, you know, American identity developed and this idea of liberty uh, had to expand, um, you know, and including of course the, the anti-slavery, the abolitionist movement, uh, the work of the authors, the Alcott family the, and, and um, and, and the Hawthorns, of course, and then the Lothrops kind of with the wrapping up this idea of memory um, and historical preservation. So yeah, we do take a very long view, but it does, you know, April 19th, 1775 really is at the, that's the hub. So, and, and of course, in April of 1775, there were loyalists uh, in Concord. Uh, I'm assuming you tell their story as well. Yeah, you know, the, the thing about the loyalists is that to me is what makes it a real story. Um, that's what makes it believable. Um, you know, it's it's people with different views. Uh, I mean, you know, we've seen that in our own times today where, you know, you've got, you know, polarized political opinions. And when you talk about the loyalists, you really do see not necessarily an us against them, good guys versus bad guys. You see a society that was ripping itself apart, um, you know, dissensions within families. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I love telling the story of Daniel Bliss, you know, a loyalist of Concord, um, you know, and even that term loyalist was just weighted with meaning, you know, meaning we are loyal, which means you are not um, loyal to the king. So otherwise they were known as Tories uh, aligned to the political party in England. Um, but, you know, with Daniel Bliss, um, you know, he, um, you know, of course, his, his, um, uh, his sister, you know, Phoebe uh, marries William Emerson, Concord's minister, who is a warm uh, Whig, to use the, the political affiliation of the time, or patriot, as we may call them today. I, be I believe the word is rebel. <laughs> yep, yeah, well, he did certainly become uh, a rebel. Um, <laughs> but um, sp spoken like a true loyalist. Um, <laughs> But um, so, you know, he had, you know, his, his brother-in-law, you know, his sister was married to a Whig, um, you know, his own brother, Thomas Theodore, um, was, a, was a hot Whig. Um, and Daniel was forced to leave town um, because he was caught giving 
uh, information about military supplies to two British officers who came out as spies in March of 1775. And of course, they were dressed in what was described as brown clothes and red handkerchiefs so as to resemble the country people. And it doesn't seem like they fooled anybody. Um, <laughs> so they got sniffed out pretty quickly, but he had to leave his home. Um, you know, and, and I, I often put it to visitors, like, you know, if, you know, you're living in the middle of, of, of a time of political turmoil, it's turning violent. Um, you know, you're seeing sort of self-selected committees worried about whether or not you're drinking tea in your own home. You know, uh, most of us today would be like, none of your business. You know, right. this is my right to do this. Um, right. You know, but then they're trying to sell you on this idea. Well, it's for the public good that you make this personal sacrifice. And if you don't make this personal sacrifice, we're going to make it for you. Um, you know, so there's a lot of people who objected to that, um, you know, or then you get down into all right, maybe you agree politically with some of these folks, but now they're talking about stockpiling arms, raising a military force, and getting ready to commit treason. Would you go that far with them? Um, how far down that road are you willing to go? I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Um, one of my favorite living history programs at the park is called Town Meeting. It's an old program. We've been doing it forever. Um, but one of you the things- doing, You were doing it when I was at the park in 1999. <laughs> yeah, yep, so that's right. Forever. It it has been around for a long time, but it's so effective. It it doesn't really grow old. Um, you know, so one of the one of the uh, things that they wrestle with is whether or not to ban the consumption of tea. So this is January 1774, and it's based on the actual town meeting warrant. Um, so whether or not to ban the consumption of tea in our homes and to consider those who violate it to be enemies. And what's really funny, and particularly lately, I've noticed in doing that program. Uh, before COVID, of course, is that a lot of people really object to that. Um, not just the the infringement on their personal freedom. You know, I like tea. I don't want to give up tea. What's the what's it to you if I drink a little tea in my home? But they've really had a problem with the idea of considering neighbors who have a different opinion of them as their enemies. And they would really push back hard on that. And what we do in the program is we discuss it. It's not scripted. It's not reader's theater. We actually debate these issues. And then we vote and then we compare how we voted to how people voted in Concord. And what I find remarkable is, you know, oftentimes they'll vote not to ban the consumption of tea based on that, that they don't want to consider their, their neighbors to be their enemies. But then what I bring in at the end is that the people in Concord had the same thing, had the same issue, and that they changed the language in the resolve uh, from enemies to unfriendly and inimicable. Um, <laughs> so apparently they had the same, the same hang up. And people sort of understand now, you know, really what this was about. Well, isn't isn't that one of the great pitfalls, I think, of, of historic interpretation, um, especially if you're doing a, a, a contentious period like the Revolution or the Civil War? You know, in America, we tend to grow up thinking in an us and them mentality. You know, if you grow up in the South, then the Yankees are the bad guys. Right. You know, if you grew up in New England, then those red coats are the bad guys, the bloody lobster backs. Um, as an interpreter, you have to constantly kind of straddle that sort of that sort of line, don't you? Absolutely. Um, you know, we have to sort of um, we try to encourage empathy and multiple points of view. You know, particularly like one of the activities that I would do um, for tours is they're called staff rides. Um, these are military tours um, of the battlefield. And so these are usually military units. Um, you know, say a company commander says, all right, I want to take my um, take my staff, you know, or a regimental commander. In some cases, I want to take my staff. I want to take my captains out and and study this. And so they'll they'll have a whole curriculum and uh, they'll take the information they got on the tour and they'll sort of boil it down um, into how they can use it operationally today. And a lot of times they're looking at it they're very interested in how the British army approached um, the situation because in many cases, our military forces now are in a similar situation. Um, but also to look at the British soldier, uh, like if you were living in Boston, they're your neighbors. Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, particularly in the earlier, like, you know, when they came in 1768, they're, they're, they're um, officers and, and non-commissioned officers and, even some private soldiers are being dispersed among the community, being quartered um, in buildings that are just embedded right in the middle of the town or sometimes uh, renting uh, rooms and things in private homes. And uh, so they, you get to know them. They, they are 
and you share a common language and a, and a common culture. Um, so even though their presence as an institution is, is resented, um, there are these personal connections that people naturally make. Um, and so to just to, to help people understand from that point of view that the, the Re American Revolution, when it began, was very much a civil war. Right. Neighbor against neighbor. Um, it's almost like the National Guard going up against the, the US Army today, you know, two parts of the same Brit larger British military structure. Um, you know, and so, yeah, we definitely multiple perspectives and, that, and that's where you find those connections. That's where people really begin to understand the period. So, so speaking of programs <laughs> and interpretation, uh, we are going to be coming up next month on Patriots Day. Um, obviously not a regular Patriots Day because of COVID, which is still going on. You obviously still have a lot of restrictions about numbers of people and, and programs and things like that. So uh, before we wrap up here, why don't you give us a, a little uh, taste of, of what the National Park is planning for Patriots Day this year? Sure. Well, you know, we're, we're following um, state requirements, which is, you know, no more than 25 people. So that really kind of kills any idea of doing live programming um, until we're out of this. So what we've done is we've partnered up with um, Minuteman Media Network, Concord Museum, um, Lexington Historical Society, uh, Arlington Historical Society, and Revolution 250. And we've created what's called the April 19th History Coalition. And um, you know, and this is really in preparation for the big 250 at the big show that's coming up in 2025. Um, just trying to get used to working together. So what we're doing is is um, a series of online programs. Um, we're doing a video series that's going to be available on, um, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, um, YouTube. Um, all the partners are going to share them, and they're all going to be available on the Revolution 250 website as well. Um, under the hashtag Virtual Patriots Day. So uh, if you follow that hashtag, you're gonna be able to follow the action. So one of the things we're doing is a series of videos called Our Tangible Past. Um, and this is one of the things where it's wonderful to work with different museums because you know we have places, we have houses, we have landscapes, battle sites, and they have stuff, they have objects. And sort of uniting these, uniting these objects and places and stories. Um, uh, you know, into a more, you know, into a more complete narrative, um, places that you can visit, things you can see. Um, so we're, we're working on that. That's under development right now. We're doing something called Revolution in Real Time. Um, and we're all taking little pieces of the chronology of the events of, you know, April 18th into April 19th. So starting at about 10 o'clock at night on April 18th, and we're going to run all through the night and the day, um, hourly or regu very regular posts um, between ourselves and all the other partners. Um, and some, you know, on-site video elements as well. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of it, giving people a sense of what the day was and how all of these different events, like Paul Revere's ride, the capture, Lexington Green, the fighting at Northbridge, how it fits together um in what the impact of it was um and uh, so that's anyway so that's all under development again it's under um hashtag virtual patriots day and hashtag revolution in real time um, and for for those of you that are joining us and watching this uh on youtube all of those links will be available down below uh underneath uh, our conversation so they can go to the links and and check things out and 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 go online and see this stuff when it's actually happening. Yep. And uh, then we're also doing some stuff because all the partners are still doing some things on their own, which is why if you want to get a complete list, everything that's going on, go to revolution250.org. Um, but we have some things um, called uh, one program, uh, programs called Voices of 1775. So it's um, a series of videos that are going to be released um, yeah, periodically, uh, April 17th through the 19th. Um, where I've created um, scripts based on the actual words of people who witnessed these events. Um, men, women, soldiers, civilians, loyalists, patriots, rebels. Um, and, um, and I have uh, actors and actresses who have come and they've 
performed these uh, these real accounts, and they're they're all about like you know two to three minutes long. Just trying to give you a range of experiences how people perceive these events. Um, we're also doing uh, living history demonstration videos. Uh, one of them is called "The Minutemen: Neighbors in Arms," um, dispelling myths about who the Minutemen were, how they prepared uh, for the coming conflict. Another one about the British Light Infantry, um, where you know, we always perceive the British soldiers just marching down the road in a bright red coat as a big target, not being able to fight back. So we're trying to dispel that myth that it was not a red coat turkey shoot. Uh, we're doing um, something uh, called uh, Caught in the Storm of War, bringing in um, Alex Kane. We're going to be talking about the civilian evacuations and uh, showing some living history scenes of the civilians um, uh, leaving their homes. Um, and one of my favorite events is the Patriot Vigil. So we're going to uh, record that, and that's going to be, um, you know, premiered as a YouTube video, not a live event um, that you can go to physically. Um, none of these are. Um, they're all going to be pre-recorded. But the Patriot Vigil, like in a normal year, of course, we have parades and battle reenactments and lots of music and noise. Uh, the Patriot Vigil is meant to be quiet and reflective. Um, a candlelight procession and ceremony. And the heart of it is that we recite the names of those who died on April 19th, um, British and, and colonial. And so Very we're going nice. to do that again. That's going to be um, in video form. Very nice. Very nice. Well, Jim, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, Same here. I, I think we're making, uh, we are all in Concord making the best of a bad situation mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the COVID, but certainly the park, the park's still there. You're still open, correct? People can still come to the park, right? Absolutely. The grounds are open. Uh, we'll have uh, public restrooms open, you know, um, in April. Um, so yeah, we, um, we are still here. You'll, you'll be able to talk with a ranger. You will have info tables set up outside at Northbridge Visitor Center and Minuteman Visitor Center uh, starting April 1st. So we're not doing programs, but you know, we keep our distance, we stay outside, and we can you can still come and, and, and talk with one of us and we can help plan your your walk through the park, your hike on the Battle Road Trail, uh, and visit to some of these sites like uh, like the North Bridge. Excellent. Well Jim Hollister, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Same and for thank you for having me. Those of you that have been watching us, thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next week with another episode of Concord Days.